speaker is uh, Dr. Bob Gill, and he's a South London GP who's going to tell us about the consequences of the uh, NHS Act. Uh, an Act of Parliament uh, called before the election, the uh, Prime Minister said there were no plans for any a top down reorganisation of the NHS, and uh, we've seen the, the biggest uh, transformation of the National Health Service since its inception. And uh, as I understand it, the, the bill. <laughs> This NHS Act is some three times as big as the original uh, bill that actually brought the NHS into being in the first place. And we've all heard about the uh, technical privatisation. We're seeing some of that happening already. But Bob will be able to tell us a little bit more uh, about that. So over to you, Bob. Thanks very much. So just to give a bit of background, I've been a doctor for 20 years, uh, about as long as the privatisation programme, in fact. Um, I've been a GP in South East London for about 11 years. I'm a GP trainer, so I, I, I oversee junior doctors and also appraise other GPs. Um, so this has given me a big opportunity to talk to my colleagues. Normally, being a GP is quite a solitude, soli solitary occupation. Um, so up until about 18 months ago, I've sort of been seeing a lot of changes being imposed on the NHS under successive governments. And I asked myself two simple questions. Does this help me do my job? Does this help my patient? And often the answer was no to both of those questions. It was only 18 months ago when I became very politicised after a conversation with my CCG chair. CCGs are the groups of GPs. I told him my patients were struggling to get assessed properly in A&E. They were getting discharged prematurely. And we had an 18% readmission rate within a month. So one in five people were being readmitted for the same problem. And his answers to these three questions were, number one, I'm too sensitive. And number two was, I'm just unlucky. He's not hearing this from anybody else. And the final straw was, I shouldn't worry because I'm not paying for it. So following this conversation, I thought I've had enough of being afraid to speak out. And uh, since then, I've had a rapid sort of education in medical politics. And it's, it's a very murky world, I'm afraid. I joined uh, the Save Lewisham Hospital campaign and learnt about the privatisation programme, which actually started in the 1980s under Thatcher. John Major in, took it a little bit further with the outsourcing of non-clinical services. Tony Blair took it very, very much further with his three main pillars of privatisation, was to break up the hospital system into separate foundation trusts in 2000, with the help of Milburn and Simon Stevens. Uh, in 2009, they brought in a a legal framework to make all hospitals vulnerable uh, called the um, unsustainable provider regime and as a consequence of that was the TSA trust special administrator which Lewisham suffered at the hands of uh, just over a year ago and the final mechanism how do you how do you force these hospitals to go bust private finance initiative so you have these three pillars which were very kindly introduced by the last Labour Party uh, Labour government and Cameron is just finishing the job because actually policy, most policy for this country is decided in the City of London. It's not decided by the population or by democracy. Um, so what we have afoot is actually a land grab. The McKinsey report in 2009 proposes to sell off two thirds of uh, NHS land and assets and this was, a, a pol this was commissioned under the last Labour government. Um, so what's, what have I noticed personally? I can give you many examples, but I probably won't have time. But one main thing that has happened in my career is the professional disempowerment. When I, came, when I worked in hospitals, consultants were gods, and everybody listened to what they said. Naturally, some abused that power, but most were respected, and whatever we felt was desirable for the patient used to occur. Now we have a massive toxic management structure which does not allow for clinical freedom. How are we doing? You've got a minute and a half. Okay. Um, so I've seen examples of where I've spoken to hospital colleagues who are afraid to speak to me in the corridor just in case they might suffer some, some harm. I've also been involved in making a documentary um, in the last year or so, and, and during that time we spoke to various whistleblowers, and a pattern emerges of institutional bullying. Anybody who dares to speak up to protect the patient will suffer a consequence. And one chap, a Dr. Peter, Bram Peter Bramble, we actually had a death threat made against one, him one by somebody in the health authority. There are, there are a whole armory of um, instruments that management can use to intimidate staff. 
you can lose your job, you can get reported to the GMC for spurious reasons, they can threaten your training, they can regulate you out, out of business. So under this culture, it's not a surprise that so much destruction is happening with a relatively quiet profession. Patient care is not a priority. Balancing budgets and reaching targets is a priority. One example I'll give you very quickly is of a paediatric registrar who was attending to a child in a, in a local hospital. The child wasn't breathing, so he was ventilating the child. A manager came in and said, can you leave that child because somebody's going to breach the four-hour target outside, just down the road. So this is the sort of respect that the profession's held in and the sort of priority actually human life is given in our current NHS. And the final thing I want to raise is demoralization. We have a media which reports again and again any bad news that occurs in the NHS, but fails to report good news like the Commonwealth Fund, which rated us based on 2011 statistics as one of the best, well, the best healthcare system in the developed world. We're overworked. We're not only doing the work that the hospital used to do, we're also doing meaningless tasks which have no evidence base. For example, pre-dementia screening. We're being asked to label people as pre-dementia. There's no treatment available. It's a meaningless procedure, and we stigmatize a whole, whole group of the population. And naturally, this is leading to a workforce crisis. So at both ends of the career, new, newly qualified doctors and people close to retirement are saying, this is not for us, and they're walking with their feet. Okay, thanks, thanks, Robert. Thanks, thanks very much. much. Thank you.